Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Where I come from, we say Dumelang, Sunny Bonani. But now that I'm in this great Mexican city, please allow me to say, Buenos dias, Dames y Capacheros. Firstly, I'd like to thank, take this opportunity to thank the IAS chairperson and the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to come and speak to you today. I stand on the shoulders of giants, past and present, as I share this message who have paved the way for me to be here today. I have been invited to talk to you about scaling treatment in resource-constrained countries, and I've been told to speak to, up to, to the point that what will it take for us to reach the last 90? I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So ladies and gentlemen, to respond to this question, please allow me to use storytelling which is a recognized African way of sharing an important message such as this one. The story is set in an African village and it's a story of the Dube family starting with Mama Nomsa, who is the mom in the family. You see, Mama Nomsa fell pregnant 18 years ago with her first child before she met her current husband. She discovered her, age, her positive HIV status when she went to labor ward and delivered her first child. At the time, she had not access to prevention, uh, to mother uh, to child transmission treatment to prevent transmission to her unborn child. She was given antiretroviral treatment as a stat dose, and her child was given prophylaxis, nevaratine prophylaxis, and they were discharged. Mama Nomsa met her husband, Monzi Dube, when her son was two years old. Her two subsequent pregnancy resulted in two HIV negative children, thanks to the successes of PMTCT. She was enrolled on art and is currently virally suppressed. Papa Monzi on the other side as a sole breadwinner of the family. She, he also tested positive and started out, but has stopped taking treatment because he said has busy, he is busy working and does not have the time to go to the clinic. The family lives next door to Sis Lily, and rumor has it that Sis Lily is doing sex work to support her two children. She has not come out because of the perceptions from the village. In one of her consultation at the local clinic, Mama Nomsa raised this concern. She said, Doctor, I have lived through HIV all my life. I have lost friends and siblings. I am scared for my children. What will it take to end this disease? so that my children never have to worry about HIV ever again. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring this story to you because this is a story of ordinary people that I have met in my lifetime. People with dreams and hope for the future who just happen to be living with HIV. To answer Mama Nomsa's story, let's start with the good news. You see, Mama Nomsa, the world has responded to the global epidemic. We, back when in 2001, when she had her first child, there has been a ramp up in um, coverage of antiretroviral. And thanks to donor response, since 2004, we've seen a rapid incline in the number of people who are accessing antiretroviral treatment. We have seen a dramatic decline in deaths and Thank, although we, are, we still have a lot to do to get to the set UNA goal in 2020. Life expectancy 
has been regained. Mama Nomsa no longer has to attend funerals every week of friends and relatives who were dying from the disease. Thanks to antiretroviral treatment, Mama Nomsa is alive and well today. In, two, in, 20, in 2014, UNAIDS introduced the 1990 cascade. And in that, it was a 1990 cascade helped us in quantifying the HIV response globally and at regional level. We were, through the 1990 cascade, we are able to focus on who is missing on the cascade. We are able to recognize that we cannot reach our goal, which is the last 90 and epidemic control, without addressing the preceding steps, which is the first and the second 90, and I will go as further as to say, including stopping new HIV infections. And where are we today? Currently, UNAIDS reports that we now have 75% of people living with HIV who know their status. 79% of them are on treatment, and 81% of them are virally suppressed. We still have a lot of work that needs to get done. We still have 5.7 million people that we need to add to treatment. We have 8 point, uh, that who still need to know the status, and we have 8.2 million people who need to access treatment, and 9.4 million who still need to be virally suppressed. The cascade has shown us that progress varies per location, it varies per age, and it varies per gender and key populations for people such as Sis Lily next door. We know that men are accessing treatment late, later on. We know that m key populations such as men having sex with men, sex workers, people who inject drugs, and adolescents are still missing from the cascade. We know that there are social factors that undermine access to the treatment cascade. We know that there are issues, especially in resource-constrained settings, that are barriers for people to access testing, art initiation, and to get to viral suppression. These are the very same things that are possibly barriers for Papa Mondi to continue his treatment. Ladies and gentlemen, let me pause and ask you this question, and I have been asking myself this question all along. We talk about hard to reach people. Are they truly hard to reach? Is it that perhaps that maybe we are the ones who are hard to find? Perhaps we have not found ways to engage with them, to keep them motivated to participate in the, uh, in the HIV response. Are our approaches to reach them correct? Do we understand the complexities that comes in with their mobility within communities? within country, towns, villages, and even within countries. They, ladies and gentlemen, like the Duba family, are people who live within our communities. They are our husbands, they are our sons and daughters, they are our neighbors. And I don't mean to trivialize the complexities in finding them. I'm just saying, have we looked enough to make sure that we're able to find them, are we able to address them the way they want to be addressed so they can be a part of the cascade? The good news is that we have come up with innovations that have helped us to reach um, um, some populations that are, who are missing from the cascade. The HIV test cell testing has shown to increase reach for men in South Africa, we've seen that work, including linkage to art, for sex workers as well in, in South Africa. And my colleagues there in, during the conference will show you how the work that has been done to reach people through self-testing. 
Botswana has shown us that you can increase demand through social media for same-day initiation. And they started the why not today message, video messaging, which has reached over 34,000 people and then motivated them to be initiated on art. We have simplified art regimens from back in the days when Mama Nomsa had to take three, uh, three tablets to one fixed dose combination, which is once a day. We have come up with new drugs and formulations. Yeah, we have introduced, through the advocacy, we've introduced cheaper drugs that are cost effective, that will allow for us to scale treatment, particularly in resource constrained countries. And the future looks even bright. Can you imagine when we can get to the day when Mama Nomsa could inject antiretrovirus once in three months and then get on with the business of raising her children every single day? Before, now, while we're waiting for this innovation, we do have Dolutegrave, which, you know, um, has, is cheaper, safer, and acceptable, and has the potential to increase coverage in, in resource-constrained countries, and it's much, much cost-efficient. But ladies and gentlemen, let me put it to you as an implementer of Node, that unless we redesign our healthcare services, our healthcare service delivery models, even these excellent innovations will not help us to achieve the last 90. Case in point, if you look at Eastern and Southern Africa, they have 5.2, they still have 5.2 million people that they need to add to the second 90. And then they still have, we still have to keep 14 million people virally suppressed on art. Instead, what do we do? We are faced with an epidemic of relatively well people, and we are asking them to come to facilities that cannot accommodate them, that has poor infrastructure, that have staff who are not competent enough to deal with their diverse needs, that are overcrowded and are risking inf uh, cross-infection between patients. A colleague of mine, Anastaka from South Africa, delved deeper into the health systems to try and understand a journey of a patient through health systems from home when they don't know their status up until viral load suppression in 12 months. And delving, what, what he has found was that just to pop up a Monday to move from be not being diagnosed to opening a file in a facility, it takes about 25 to 30 steps, 25 to 30 intervention for him to just open a file. For him to get to the point of viral suppression within a year, they, it takes about 108 interventions or steps to get to that point. And every time he has to go to facilities, he has to endure long waiting hours um, to get the treatment that he needs. The, ladies and gentlemen, there cannot be any reasonable expectation that a busy man like Papa Mondi could sustain the burden of interactions and waiting times in a facility like that on an ongoing business for, in his lifetime. We are setting him up for failure. We heard, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, in the opening session yesterday, that donor funding is decreasing, that more and more countries have to now depend on domestic resources. We've heard how countries have to move to um, national health coverage that prompts us to integrate services to be more efficient. I put it to you that the time has come to drastically reconfigure our health service delivery models. 
We have started doing this, but we need to move faster and faster now to reach 2020. We need to deliver self, self um, we need to rethink our self service delivery models that are sustainable and patient centric. And we need to do this so that we can free up existing health services for people who need them, for people who are genuinely sick, so that health practitioners will focus on those individuals. And we do have evidence to support that interventions that are outside of facilities can have better patient outcomes and they've been shown to be efficient in that they can maximize the number of patients on art while reducing cost to patients and cost to health systems. Some of these interventions are within health systems and they are low tech and ha can have maximum impact, such as significantly reducing waiting times and the steps that you have seen before. Namibia, who by the way has reached 1990, have shown us that community art is, yeah? They have data to show us that community art does have good retention and viral load outcomes. So what are we waiting for? We need to scale community art initiation. Data from South Africa has shown us that retention and viral load outcomes, and uh, so that, that multi-scripting is not, is not inferior to two months. So six months multi-scripting is not inferior to, six month, to, to two months. So why do we want to hold on to patients and keep asking them to come back to the facility? My colleague has said, Francois has said, that clinicians are the only people who think that it's fun to attend clinics. We need to take our, our antiretrovirals out the outside of clinics. And there are great innovations that have shown that we can do this. But the win-win for me is that this is an opportunity to address local challenges that can, and, 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 and empower local entrepreneurs and get them into the business of coming up with models that can deliver art to communities outside of clinics. Keep up, Thailand started the K-pop-led uh, integrated health services where key populations, people like this Lily, can do things, can lead services by themselves, for themselves. And ma many other countries have followed suit. We know that it is a model that works. We need to make sure that we scale it now. Very importantly, ladies and gentlemen, is that we need to make sure that we continue to target, to be precise in our programming, in targeting the populations that we need to reach. We know that it is not a one size fit all, that we need to be precise about where to go, who to find, when to find them. Community mobilization works. When we involve communities, we have seen that there is a better response and better outcomes in reaching 1990 goals. We have seen this in uh, a case in South Africa where literally the program scaled outreach testing, community health, they employed community health agents, lay counselors, they scaled community art groups and community art um, adherence clubs, and they've been able to demonstrate that they can retain patients in care with good outcomes. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that art alone is not enough, that we need to um, include combination tre pre uh, treatment and prevention um, approaches to make sure that not only we put patients on treatment, but then we stop new infections. And we need to address reasons why people do not um, adhere to prevention strategies such as 
um, uh, such as PrEP. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say that this has to be a person-centered response that is participatory as well as empowering. We need to continue to use the 1990 cascade to identify gaps and target interventions in areas of greatest unmet needs. We need, need, we need to recognize the need to reconfigure our health systems by shifting more and more to community-based models. We need to scale innovations that enhance patient engagement and convenience. We need to maximize differentiated service, uh, uh, service delivery models and integrated approaches to achieve coverage. We know that we need to work with community and civil society to generate demand for quality of services and we need to tackle stigma and discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, stigma and discrimination is, hu is a human right violation. We need combination approaches that are, uh, are essential to increasing our coverage and reducing HIV incidence. So, if we are to respond to Mama Nomsa, I'd say that we need to work together to address these issues so that the beginning of the end of HIV becomes a reality for Mama Nomsa and her family. And how does this story end? Well, I'll put it back to you, ladies and gentlemen. It depends on all of us. It depends on what we do today and tomorrow to make sure that this happens. It is all in our hands. I'd like to thank, um, acknowledge Veta Recha and my colleagues for assisting me with this presentation. I'd like to thank the partners and collaborators and more importantly, the funders who have allowed for this to take place. Thank you very much.